Good morning, everybody at New Creation Church. What a great church. Wow. Looks like the best was yet to come. So it's great to be back here this weekend with Cindy and Summer, our daughter, and with my parents and sister. I was thinking, just as a, an opening anecdote, about the night that we chose a name for New Creation Church. For about the first six months or so, we just called the church the church plant, which was not a great name, just the church plant. In fact, we even had a summer softball team, and we called ourselves the planters. So in our team chair, instead of one, two, three, let's go, was one, two, three, let's grow. You want to try it again 20 years later? One, two, three, let's grow. See, it's already working, Mike and Michelle. So one evening, uh, Pastor Letty uh, called a meeting to select a name for our church, and he invited all of us to bring our best name ideas for this church. Well, I care deeply about this, as with most, most things, and was thinking of names, and I was teaching at Union and even surveyed some of my students. Well, the two names I brought for this church as new ideas were, first of all, Living Water, and a second name, Heart and Soul. Well, looking back, I still like the name Living Water, but I'm not sure what I was thinking with Heart and Soul. <laughs> well, it turned out that some of the other members of our plant had also cared pretty deeply and were thinking of their own names. I remember Chuck Hagley uh, brought a name that night called The Journey. The Journey, pretty good name. Uh, it made me a little tired to think about it because we'd already been on a journey, but it was a name that had some support. And I remember Pastor Letty, who was our part-time pastor, he brought two names for the church plant. The first name that he brought was The Light. Uh, pastor Steve had planted a church up in Omaha called The Rock, so he loved the idea, and, and there was some beauty to it, of The Rock in Omaha and The Light here in Lincoln. And then Steve brought another name an out-of-the-box name that he and Melissa were excited about. He introduced this name by mentioning a popular new reality TV show on TV called Survivor. Have you heard of it? It was brand new, and everybody was all up uh, about Survivor. So Steve brought the name Soul Survivor, Seventh-day Adventist Church, and he spelled it S-O-U-L. So rather than soul, one survivor, S-O-L-E, survivor in the TV show, we would be soul survivor, Seventh-day Adventist Church. Well, I wasn't sure how to, what to think about this name, personally. There was some interesting discussion in the room. One thing I knew, I worked in media, was that TV shows only lasted a short time. I mean, there was no way in 20 years we would ever even know what the show survivor was, Right? Shows what I know. But it didn't have quite enough support for Soul Survivor, Seventh-day Adventist Church. And then we were all quiet because nobody's name had enough support. And then someone, and I believe it was Chuck Hagley, suggested a new name. He suggested the name New Creation. And a text that went with it, uh, went with it from 2 Corinthians 2.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone the new is here. And there was this silence in the room, sort of this reverence as we all kind of thought about this verse. And then we took a vote, and there was overwhelming support for our new name, New Creation. I remember Pastor Steve's prayer that evening. It was a beautiful prayer. Thank you, Lord, for New Creation. And it was a special evening of joy and unity in a journey that wasn't always easy, but that was worth it. Let's bow our heads as we start this morning. Lord, I thank you for new creation. Twenty years later, it's joyful for uh, my family to come back and see what you have done here, how this has been planted and watered, but only by your son has this church grown. And I pray for this church to continue to grow in the hearts of those here and together as a church family. In the name of your son, I pray. Amen. Well, please open your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew 13, and in a little while, I want to tell you more about the story of new creation, if you'd like to hear it, at least from one perspective, but first of all, let's spend some time uh, in God's Word, where we can all grow together, and I, I went back and forth on this, but it just seems, Mike, like the kind of church that will do this with me. This is a parable of Jesus in Matthew 13. And it's just really fun to kind of visualize it. So some of you are about to avoid eye contact with me, and that's fine. 
But I would like to invite a few people as I read this parable to illustrate it, to demonstrate it, act it out up front here. So I first of all need a farmer, and the nominations are open. Anybody willing to play the role of a farmer? Well, I'll use you guys in a minute, but I need an, an, an older farmer, yes. Yeah, come on. Come on, Ramsey. All right. <laughs> I, can tell, I can tell you've got gifts. I know who you are. All right. Congratulations on your upcoming marriage. So right up here, Ramsey. Uh, just stand right there. All right. Now I need four seeds, and these can be all ages. So come on up, kids. I need four seeds. Yep, I got one there. And let's go in height. So the, the shortest one here, and then the next tallest right here, and then Taven, my nephew right here. What's your name? Preston, right? You're what? Okay, good. You're still a child. Are you 13 here coming up? All right. You know, when Jesus turned 12 and 13, he became an adult. Congratulations, Preston. All right, I need a couple of birds. A couple of birds over here. Two birds. They can be older birds. or yeah, yeah, Ladies, thank you. Thankfully, we have some young, lovely birds right here. All right, ladies, right here. Just two more. A sun, a sun, and then two thorns. A sun. Who is a, okay, I, I think that's an obvious one. All right. Yeah. Right here. Right here. I can tell I like you. All right. Yeah, another thorn and a sunshine. All right, right here. All right, a lovely thorn and a, a bright, beautiful sun. Right here. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So you guys, when you hear your parts, you don't really have to say anything. I just want you to act out the parable. The sunshine right here. Seeds, you have a very important part. You are seed number one, num number two, number three, and seed number four. Here we go. Jesus told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. Where's the farmer? Okay, the sun back up a little bit. Back up a little bit. The sun just to back up. There you go. The farmer... Okay, the farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the first seed, the first seed fell along the path. Fall down on the path. And some birds came and ate up the first seed. Ooh, they're going to drag you away, seed. All right, drag him away. Good job. Thank you, birds. All right. Yeah, thank you. Very good. Unforgettable. Thank you, birds. You're done now. All right. The second seed fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. Second seed, it sprang up quickly. Jump up. Because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Didn't last long, did he? Thank you. The third seed fell among thorns. Third seed which grew up and choked the plants. They choked the, the seed. Yeah, that didn't go well, seed. Sorry. You, some of you are going to dream about those thorns tonight. And finally, here's the good news, Preston. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, stand up, Preston, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Good job, everybody. Thank you. All right. Seed number one is still recovering. All right. Wow, those birds, ladies, you were great. <laughs> All right. So you may know this parable, and now that we've read it again and seen it illustrated, and I realize I should be using my um, clicker here as we went. Okay. All right. Usually in a parable of Jesus, we would sit and go, what do you think it means? Like, what do you think this symbol means or that symbol? But the good news with this parable is that Jesus tells us. So rather than us trying to conjecture what this parable means, let's let Jesus tell us what it means. Take a look. Verse 20. Jesus said the seed, f uh, let's see. Uh, there we go. All right, let me pick up... Um, in verse 18, just before my slide here, Jesus said, listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes. This represents, uh, represented by the birds, right? Someone who lands on hard path, 
the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their hearts. This is the seed sown along the path. Now, notice that this first type of seed, poor Xander, he had no chance. He landed on hard ground, and he had no chance to grow at all on hard ground. And the birds came along and ate him up. Very sad. The seed falling on rocky ground, Jesus said, refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So the second seed, Jesus says, it makes it to the ground and it begins to grow in the rocky ground. But it doesn't grow much because it doesn't have a strong root, doesn't have a foundation. It's very tender, very delicate. So this little growing plant has no chance against the rocky soil. What do you think this all means? What does this mean for us? What does the soil mean? We'll get to that. The third seed, Jesus says, falling among the thorns, thank you, Taven, refers to someone who hears the word, that's good, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. So you had a little plant that was growing that pressed through the ground. But the little plant was too worried. It wasn't just looking at the sun and receiving the rain. It was looking around, worried, and the thorns came and choked it. Notice that the thorns represent bad things like worries, but also good things. Things like desire to, to have things in your life. Maybe even good things, but may distract us from the best things. And then the good news. The seed falling among... Uh, the verse isn't here, but the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it, Preston. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. How satisfying was it to think of Preston planted in good soil and growing thirty, sixty, a hundred times, growing a deep root, fending off thorns, and producing a crop hundreds of times what was sown. From soft ground, Jesus taught us, seed grows abundantly and beautifully, bearing fruit that no one can begin to count. Look at you all here today because of the role that someone's played in your life. So here's the question. What do you think the soft ground represents? What does it represent? It represents your soft heart. Think about a time in your life where you were the most soft-hearted. Maybe a little boy or a little girl before you'd become calloused by the things of life. Maybe a young person, newly married, little babies, soft-hearted. And things grew and nurtured and you were joyful. There's one more key word that Jesus used when he told this parable. Verse 15, he said, For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and in turn, I would heal them. As we leave this parable, I want to invite you to consider if and how your own heart has become calloused in any way, meaning hard-hearted in any way. And to consider the importance of a soft heart, a soft heart toward God, a soft heart toward those around you, even those that might disagree with you theologically or politically. Truth is important, but so is the gentleness of Christ, who showed us how to live with both grace and truth. At a time when seemingly 98% of our country has become conditioned to tear each other apart so easily. Christ reminds us that we do not have to act that way. We are called to the soft heart of Christ. I loved what my brother-in-law Dan shared this morning, even about the way we use our time and thoughts. It's not that it's right or wrong, but how much time we, we spend on the things, the horizontal things of earth, rather than looking to the sun and the water of heaven. So I also thought studying this parable today 
would be appropriate to the story of new creation. A church planted 20 years ago this fall. I thought about this a lot this week in preparing the sermon. It was 20 years ago this fall that this church was planted here in Lincoln. And some of this, in fact, some of the dynamics and dramatics of this parable also remind me of the early journey of new creation. Let me show you who this, who is this family? I don't know. One of them, two or three of them still look great. One of them has aged a lot, huh? This was Cindy and me and our two daughters, Allie and Morgan, when we lived here in Lincoln, when this church was started. Our, young, our youngest, Summer, wasn't even born yet. In the summer of 2000, a few of us began dreaming about a new church here in Lincoln. A year earlier, Cindy and I had moved uh, here to Lincoln from Maryland. I had worked at the Adventist World Headquarters for a few years at Adventist Review Magazine uh, for a few years just outside Washington, D.C., and we had been, as young adults, like you guys' age, really involved in our local church, a contemporary church, and it was great just to be so involved. And we also had brought in a, a young adult program at the General Conference. In fact, Mike, I apparently have the auspicious title of being the one who brought drums into the Adventist World Headquarters <laughs> for the very first time. And you may look at me and think, wow, I didn't know you were that cool, and I really wasn't. But I remember... Uh, Elder Neil Wilson, who had been the president, Neil Wilson, calling after this program, and I said, what do you think, you know, Elder Wilson, you know, are people, the drums, and, you know, it's a new language of worship, and he goes, look, if all those inane, ridiculous meetings didn't desecrate that place, nothing will, so <laughs> <laughs> he was quite, quite honest in his older years, I guess. Anyway, a nice conversation. Well, anyway, when we came to Union College, where I taught uh, in the humanities division, um, we appreciated College View Church. You know, loved the people there and the pastors and, you know, remain friends to this day. But honestly, it was hard to go from being so involved in a smaller church, if you've ever had that experience, to suddenly become just a one of a thousand members in a larger church. You know, it's like, wow, we missed that level of involvement. Well, my parents, uh, Chuck and Michelle Nash, had also moved to Lincoln that same year. And my parents are wonderful musicians and have been very involved in their church in Orlando. And so we began to talk a little bit and dream together about maybe a chance for, you know, new people to be involved in a contemporary church that would reach new families and get their kids involved and become kind of like this, a family-friendly friendly little church. We began talking with a few other friends, Chuck Hagley and the Opitzes and some other people in town who were really good, talented people and new things grow, and they, they had been interested in a vision of a church plant, too. Well, just an aside, that summer was, some of you that are, are Adventists know, every five years there's a general conference session, and that year was in Toronto. And I was up there doing some writing for that event, and we ran into a couple, a pastor couple, named Ralph and B. Neal from here in Lincoln. And they were pastoring a church called the Capital View Church here in Lincoln. And they explained some of their needs and how they had this big building and very few people. And, you know, we, we got to know them a little bit and got to, well, we thought maybe they wanted us to come help there at Capital View. Maybe we'd be warm, warmly welcomed a group of young people to bring in some new ideas. I can tell you uh, it might have seemed like the right idea, but it wasn't. Um, we went to uh, Capital View for a, a, a couple of months and got involved. Um, but honestly, it was ground that was, was not the right ground for these types of seeds of ideas. And, you know, sometimes when you have a new idea, it's not the right thing to try to change other people. I remember a quote from Dr. John Pauline, it's a terrible thing to make someone go against their conscience, even if they're wrong, even if they're wrong, even if they're right or wrong. And so we learned a lesson there, that rather than try to change something that was long in existence, it was better to start out in fresh air space. So we began to meet, uh, began to have meetings in the summer of, of 2000 about a church plant, uh, or at least a, a worship service that, that might appeal to different people here in town and, and young families. We began to meet in the basement of Union College, down in their basement auditorium, for a weekly Sabbath service that was simple and special. Uh, we had rotating speakers, Chuck Hagley, I would speak sometimes, Dad would lead worship, uh, young adults coming out, some kids, and, and some people that were never, had never been part of something like this before, including my uncle, Paul Carpenter, who decided to at least go along for the ride and check this out. 
I remember my Uncle Paul sitting in the back of College View Church for many years. He worked as a deacon, you know, wasn't terribly involved, but this was a new thing for him, and he was willing, like some people, to come check it out. Um, there was a, a speaker uh, one week named John Matthews from the conference, and um, I remember John suggesting, he's like, Andy, you know, this is going to be viewed as competitive with the College View Church. Why don't you, you know, meet with them and position this as something that has spawned out of a group of people from College View Church so that there will be, you know, good harmony and chemistry rather than being viewed as rivalry. And I will confess um, in some of my idealism and uh, attitude at that time that I didn't take John's advice very seriously. And I, I look back and wish that I had been more soft-hearted, had been more gentle, and less about, hey, this is our new idea, and more about, you know, can we all celebrate something new together? And I think when we, we look back at those experiences, we may have some regrets and, um, and are thankful for the grace of Christ, nevertheless, during that type of experience. Well, uh, about this time, we heard about someone named Ron Gladden, who was doing some work for the Kansas-Nebraska Conference and was really gifted at developing church plants. And Dad and I had Ron over to our house and met with him, and Ron gave some advice. He said, look, in something new, people are going to feel worried. You don't want to push the envelope when it comes to theology. You don't want to push the envelope when it comes to finances. You can push the envelope when it comes to style, to worship style. And that was good advice. Ron um, really got us connected and on the radar with the conference and began to come now and then and visit our church. We had moved over to the Mid-America Union headquarters. Some of you know where that is, which was one of the sweetest seasons of our church plant. In fact, I remember once Ron, who was not a, uh, a very musical type of person, he came up for the closing prayer, but he came up too early. <laughs> we were singing the potter's hand. And just as he thought the band was stopping, it was building to a new verse. <laughs> so he stood there, I'm captured by your holy calling. And he had to sing for the last couple of minutes of that song with kind of a stunned look on his face. <laughs> Those of others of you that are introverts like me will, can relate to that experience. Well, this was one of the happiest seasons in the spring of 2001 for our church plant. Um, we had all kinds of new families coming, and Dad, I remember mentoring, you know, people like the Kleins and the Lees and, and the Herbals and other people in music and getting young people involved. Um, we had more and more uh, families with gifts and children. I remember on Easter, hiding Easter eggs. Remember Ron Mallow always talked about this, like this beautiful Sabbath day. And whatever you think about Easter eggs, you know, out on the grass, the kids running around like crazy picking up Easter eggs, and it was just exciting to see, um, you know, people's growth and renewal and being part of a, a new thing like this. It's during this time that we chose the name New Creation, I believe. Um, well, during this time, we began to have regular leadership meetings every week. The meetings were open, which proved to be both a blessing and a curse. They were wide open to anyone who wanted to attend. Um, an atmosphere of openness always sounds good, but the flip side is that sometimes the vision can be challenged and changed a little bit. The truth is uh, a church plant brings out adventurous type of people. And that's a good thing, people who like exploring new frontiers. It can also bring, bring out people that might have their own personal vision for how things should go. And so there was, some, there was some tension during this time a little bit. There were some people that were part of the church plant from the beginning who when some new people came to the leadership meetings, then they left because of past conflicts that they had had here in Lincoln in other settings. It's just all part of the human dynamic and part of our learning experience. And that's why there was another group of people that, as I think back, are so important to um, any type of experience in church, including a new church, and that is the soft hearts. There were some people in life, there are some people in life who are just always soft ground, Often these people are the ones married to the adventurous types, keeping them level. People like Cindy and Michelle and others who were married to some of us who wanted to bring new things in and sometimes at warp speed. These soft-hearted people also experience the rocks of life, the thorns, the birds, 
but they have a way of keeping people steady, rising above and helping plants to grow 160 or 30 times as much. And I want to pay a compliment to your leaders, Mike and Michelle Bernard, because though I've never really lived in the same city with you and just see you guys periodically through the years in some of our shared uh, occupations, Mike and Michelle are the type of leaders who set a positive tone, and I'm not surprised the good things that I've been hearing about new creation in these past months and years. And I think the two of you... It is true that some plant and some water, even as God makes it grow. Well, after meeting for a while at the Union Office building, we began to seek support from the Kansas-Nebraska Conference to be an actual church, to be the real deal, and to have a paid pastor. After receiving input from people on our leadership team, my dad drafted the document that we would share with the conference and that ultimately resulted in us becoming an official church. The pastor assigned to our church was Steve Letty, who had planted a number of churches, including, as I mentioned, the church The Rock in Omaha. Are they still active and going? I haven't heard about them lately. Okay. Well, Steve and Melissa were young and likable and fun. They were still growing as leaders, just as all of us were. With the benefit of time, I know that many of us Uh, Look back on this early experience, wishing it were smoother and softer at times. There were some of us who had been the initial leaders who perhaps felt a little overlooked and undervalued in the new season of this church, phase two, as new leaders were given responsibilities. So there were understandably some mixed emotions during this stage. You know, even this week, I had a church member want to meet with me and where I'm pastoring in Denver, and he said, You know, he'd been a founding member of this church, been there like 40 years, 50 years, and he had felt a little overlooked by us new pastors that had come in. And that's not a fun feeling, and I apologize that I would never want you to feel disrespected, and the the need to be valued is inherent, I think, in all of us. It's often true that there are different seasons in the life uh, and growth of anything, including a church. About a year into our plant, there were a series of events that rocked us in several other ways. First of all, September 11, 2001, one year into our uh, plant. I'll never forget the look on everyone's faces that day as we met for Sabbath school and church. At our third location, the Disciples of Christ Church just off 70th near Old Cheney. I think we might underestimate the corporate trauma of an event such as 9-11 and also a year like 2020. As my daughter Morgan, a psychology major, likes to say, it's important to acknowledge when we're not okay. And I wondered how much that event threw us off and affected us that year. On a personal note, this was also uh, to become a time of crisis for my own family. I was feeling restless in my work as an English and journalism teacher at Union, and I began to pursue a business idea magazine. This dream would slowly become a nightmare for my own family and me, a consuming project that I woke up and went to bed with and dominated my thoughts. And I can remember even coming to church at our fourth location, I think the Cornerstone Church, uh, the, the one downtown. I can remember going to church, and as we sang every praise song, I would mentally apply the lyrics of every praise song to my business idea. Now, if that makes no sense, then you haven't ever started something that consumed you, something that might have been good but become so consuming that it dominated even my worship experience. Everything was about the dream. The thorns of worry and anxiety began to choke my own life and family. We received some unexpected news during this time, a third pregnancy with our third daughter, and some health problems that Cindy began experiencing. We moved uh, away and moved in with Cindy's parents for four months in Maryland while Cindy um, went through a difficult pregnancy, and then I ended up taking a job at Southern. But God was gracious to us, as he is to you. After the long winter, our daughter Summer Grace was born. She is here today at age 17. Raise your hand, Summer. 
And a few years later, I was unexpectedly invited to be a pastor down in Collegedale, Tennessee, and I have loved this work for 12 years. I re came to realize that the restlessness I felt in journalism was really a desire to be in ministry. And I had realized that I had nothing left for publishing and really only cared about one book, uh, God's Word. There was one final chapter to the first two years of new creation. After a period of growth to probably about 150 people at one point, there was a mass departure of many of the leadership over theological questions. Specifically, many leaders and members began to question Adventist teaching related to our salvation by grace in Christ alone, and things like whether the Sabbath still had a place in our walk with Christ. I have to tell you, this also rocked the world for the remaining members of the church, and even for us too, though we had moved away. These were friends and very smart people who had left the church in mass, and their questions were difficult ones for many of us. You know, we each have to make our faith our own, and even in our desert times, uh, we can uh, find great fruit when we turn for ourselves to God's word, as the very first Adventist did. I would invite you to ground yourself in God's word for yourself. I studied for about a year and a half deep into many nights, finding answers for myself and a stronger faith than I had had before. One thing I personally discovered is that our salvation rest has always been by the grace of God, going back all the way to Eden. Our salvation rest and Sabbath rest coexisted in the Old Testament, and they continue to coexist in the New Testament. Well, 20 years later, from the founding group at New Creation, I believe just one member remains, Paul Carpenter. The quiet, the quiet longtime member at College View who perhaps was curious and maybe even reluctant about this new church plant idea and now has become not only your drummer, like Phil Collins up here, <laughs> greeter, speaker, and I'm very proud of my Uncle Paul here on his birthday. <laughs> this morning, Paul walked with me down to your prayer garden. What a beautiful project. I loved it. feel like we want to copy it. Here it is down here. If some of you haven't had a chance to go uh, where it eventually takes us to the cross of Christ. And this was always the dream for new creation, right? What you're experiencing right now where people could come and find Christ and friendship and their place in ministry, where you felt needed and valued. The call of Christ was never just, I love you. It was always, I need you to be involved in the ministry, and I will be here with you. Seeds grow best from soft ground and with deep roots and without thorns. People grow best from soft ground with deep roots and without thorns. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here.